Hi, this is Duncan Ferguson. This is the first of four parts on glucocorticoid therapy in small animal practice. And the first part, which we're going to start now, is on uh, basically ha the, how glucocorticoids work and their major therapeutic effects that we seek. So for starters, let's, let's talk about uh, some relevant adrenal physiology. Uh, we're going to talk about the hypothalamic pituitary uh, adrenal axis and how it's regulated, make the point that ACTH is uh, normally uh, secreted in an episodic fashion, and to talk about how what we know, at least in dogs and cats, uh, is where it's the same and where it's somewhat different than in human species. And, but the fundamental thing that we have to, to uh, have you understand is that there's a negative feedback by the secreted hormone cortisol made by the adrenal gland, and that feedback exerts itself at the pituitary and hypothalamic levels. It's also worth the, reviewing the adrenal histology. This is a cross-section of the uh, adrenal gland uh, going from the capsule on the outside to the medulla. And the medulla, you may recall, makes the catecholamines norepinephrine and epinephrine. Where do the glucocorticoids, uh, where are they made? They're made by these two sections here, the fasciculata and reticularis. So that's glucocorticoids. And of course, glomerulosa section focuses on uh, the production of mineralocorticoids, aldosterone. And that's not to say a little bit of aldosterone isn't make, made on other parts of the adrenal gland, but that's, that's a useful way for us to think about it because it will be um, the, particularly the fasciculata and reticularis that will be suppressed when we give exogenous glucocorticoids uh, to an animal and suppress ACTH. So we'll keep that in mind. When we get adrenal atrophy as a result of steroids, then it's going to be the vesiculata and reticularis. In this slide, we have a figure of the uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis, or HPA axis. And what we want to look at here is, first of all, review the physiology that it's corticotrophin-releasing hormone that's made by hypothalamus. And then adrenocorticotrophic hormone is made by the pituitary. Of course, that has its direct positive effect on the adrenal glands. And it's the negative feedback of cortisol on both the pituitary and the hypothalamus that we have to be consider. And this is uh, sort of a preface to why it's so difficult to recover the adrenal glands following exogenous glucocorticoids because you can't just give exogenous ACTH. And of course, the whole reason for, or one of the major reasons for the adrenal axis is for an animal to be able to respond to a stress. And so we are taking away that, um, a little bit of that potential when we start to suppress the endogenous uh, rhythms associated with uh, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. In this slide, it's uh, basically a graphic of the secretion of ACTH, which you can see is pulsatile, uh, against cortisol, which it's secreted in also pulsatile fashion, but it's, it's got a, uh, in, in humans at least, it has a diurnal variation, which is as the peak in the morning, in the trough in the afternoon or, or in the evening. Um, and so this has been something that's been investigated in animals, and we'll get to that in the next slide. So what do we know about these rhythms in dogs and cats? Uh, first of all, we know there are episodic rhythms of ACTH and cortisol, uh, but there are no apparent diurnal variation patterns seen for cortisol in dogs and cats. And so this is only important to us insofar as um, we normally try to mimic Mother Nature's patterns when we uh, want to give glucocorticoids in as physiological fashion as we can, uh, timing-wise and sometimes dose-wise. Um, so just to know that we don't have a particular um, diurnal variation of cortisol uh, shown, in the at least in the dog and the cat. 
Turning to the cellular action of uh, glucocorticoids, uh, this relatively complex slide taken from a review article, uh, the, the main thing I wanted to point out is that we have several locations in which glucocorticoids seem to act. And I'm going to start with the one that is the most classical uh, and most slow type of action at the cellular level, and that is where glucocorticoids basically move into the, into the cell, interact with the glucocorticoid receptor, which then translocates to the nucleus and interacts with the hormone response element on DNA. And that leads to alteration, either up or down, of messenger RNA production for certain proteins and leads to protein um, value amounts going up or down. The, so that's a slow, that's more of the classical uh, action of uh, glucocorticoids. Uh, we can have sort of intermediate effects uh, or medium actions in terms of length, but the ones I want to focus on also are the ones that are more recently understood as being fairly rapid biological responses to glucocorticoids. We've been taking advantage of these for many years when we give shock doses of glucocorticoids, and these are mediated through membrane receptor uh, for glucocorticoids. And these are some of them are nonspecific effects on the on the plasma membrane, but some are mediated through membrane receptors that alter basically electrical excitability and transmembrane currents, a little bit of phosphorylation. And so these are the things that we probably are seeing when we give a high, a very high dose of gl shocks, glucocorticoid dose, um, and what we see shortly thereafter. So let's look at the physiological actions of glucocorticoids. Why do we have them in, our, in the body? One of the major reasons is for the maintenance of fluid homeostasis and the sort of the maintenance of volume in the body. Another is to uh, be a modulator of glucose metabolism and increase gluconeogenesis, um, decrease protein synthesis, and of course those things that we attribute to being acting against insulin. Um, in the terms of protein and lipid metabolism, we, we generally will see uh, that it's an anabolic hormone in physiological quantities, but at higher doses, we get catabolism. And of course, Glucocorticoids are important for optimal mobilization of free fatty acids through the hormone-sensitive lipase. And finally, uh, an effect that we try to take advantage of often as uh, clinicians is that they have an anti-inflammatory effect even at physiological doses, and they seem to maintain microcirculation and uh, uh, op the opening of the microcirculation is also alter its vascular permeability and stabilize membranes and also uh, balance or inhibit the uh, production of prostaglandins and alter free radical formation. As we get to pharmacological dosages, the main things we look for are the anti-inflammatory effects or immune suppressive effects, which we'll get to. But we also know about these metabolic effects, and drug companies have tried for many years to try to separate these two um, by drug design, and that's not been possible. So we need to accept that they're coming together. So you, you're going to have an anti-insulin effect or an increase uh, in drinking, for example, in an animal that is being treated for uh, an in inflammation. So on this uh, slide, I basically want you to just focus on the big three circles shown here. We have effects of glucocorticoids that are anti-inflammatory, and I've listed, listed for you the various ways that's manifest. You can read that. Uh, the immune suppression, that overlaps with that, and the metabolic effects. And teasing these apart is very difficult. Um, they all seem to have similar common mechanisms at one level or another. And so we need to accept that the good effects that we see for glucocorticoids are going to come with some that we don't really uh, prefer to have in our patients. Anytime you give glucocorticoids to uh, an animal, you're going to have to warn the owner that they're going to have to make sure there's plenty of water available and they're gonna, more than likely going to have to take the animal outside or, in the case of a cat, make sure they change the litter box more frequently. 
how does this happen? What are the effects on water and electrolyte balance? Well, first of all, we know that antidiuretic hormone at the posterior pituitary, uh, its release and its action at the kidney are diminished. Uh, in addition, we have effects to increase the extracellular fluid volume. That's one of its physiological effects, and that tends to increase glomerular filtration rate, leading to more urine. Glucocorticoids are absolutely essential for, for the maximal dilution of urine, so getting below that uh, fixed specific gravity of 1008 to 1012, you need glucocorticoids for the kidney to be able to accomplish that. And we also know that because most glucocorticoids we administer are not totally devoid of mineralic corticoid activity, we can see not only the retention of sodium um, leading to hypertension, but also possibility of hypokalemia. As we'll talk about in uh, other modules, we often try to use glucocorticoids to suppress the immune system. And indeed, glucocorticoids are known for being particularly good at suppressing the cells, that is, the cell-mediated immunity, and the actions of those cells within the immune system. And, as, and what we, we know when we look at a uh, CBC is that we can get a low lymphocyte and a low eosinophil count. These two uh, types of cells are, are highly sensitive to glucocorticoids. We even call glucocorticoids as lympholytic. Um, what, one thing we also see is that glucocorticoids alter the distribution of, particularly of neutrophils. They normally hang out in the periphery or in the margins of vessels, but when you give glucocorticoids, they then are mobilized, and we call that demargination, and that will lead to your mature neutrophilia that you can see um, in the case of a glucocorticoid or stress. Um, of course, one of the things that we find as a side effect of glucocorticoids is that we are suppressing the attraction of leukocytes to a site of inflammation, and by doing so, we are diminishing the organisms or animals' response to that inflammation. Um, that may sound good at one level, but in, at the level of fighting off a bacterial or viral infection or fungal infection, we sometimes run into problems. Um, we also know that glucocorticoids can interfere with interferon synthesis uh, and the functional capacity of monocytes and macrophages is, is, are diminished. Let's focus for a minute on the cellular mechanism of glucocorticoids, in particular to focus on the distinction of the anti-inflammatory effects from the immune suppression effects as, it's, as they are handled through mediators that are lipid mediators like prostaglandins and um, thromboxanes and leukotrienes. Uh, so if we think about the fact that the plasma membrane uh, has all these lipids, and that's shown here, in, and we have an enzyme called phospholipase A2 that liberates arachidonic acid, that's the sort of the starting material, if you will, for the precursors we're going to talk about. And let's talk about where they go through the cyclooxygenase pathway. They can end up being prostaglandins, prostacyclin, thromboxane, PGF2-alpha, PGE2. So that's the cyclooxygenase, so the COX pathway. Um, in, if they go through... Uh, the lipoxygenase pathway, or the LOX pathway, where you can see they produce leukotrienes, which are, in a sense, based on their name, a chemotactic lipid. And so that, that's the mechanism by which we see cell-mediated immunity being suppressed on one hand, and on the COX side, we are mainly suppressing the inflammatory effects of those mediators. And basically what glucocorticoids do is to produce a, through the nuclear receptor, uh, a protein called lipocortin, and that lipocortin antagonizes the phospholipase II activity. It's worth talking a, a little bit also about cardiovascular effects of glucocorticoids. We've already talked about sodium retention, uh, but they also have seem to have these positive effects, um, which are probably through membrane receptors and also uh, nuclear receptor activities to be positive chronotropes and inotropes. 
they tend to reduce the um, permeability that can occur in situations like inflammation in the, in the capillaries. And we know that glucocorticoid, at least physiological quantities, are absolutely essential for the optimization of catecholamine receptors in their number. And so maximal catecholamine sensitivity uh, requires glucocorticoids. In shock, we believe that there are vasoactive products of lipid peroxidation through that arachidonic acid cascade we just discussed. And so thromboxane A2, for example, which can be decreased only in early stages of shock uh, by glucocorticoids, are, is probably associated with some of this imbalance and, uh, and really produced in an attempt to try to sustain core um, blood pressure. Um, but at some level, it becomes detrimental to the animal. Just a brief bit about endocrine effects because <clears throat> it's not uncommon for a clinician who's administered glucocorticoids to start to find other things being altered in, the, in an endocrine panel. Uh, it shouldn't be a surprise that ACTH is suppressed. We talked about its me mechanism. But in addition, uh, TSH uh, and growth hormone are suppressed. What's the impact of this? Well, first of all, we have a lowering of thyroid hormone that is not associated with hypothyroidism when glucocorticoids are given. At least we don't have any evidence for that. Uh, certainly cortisol is reduced. And if growth hormone is suppressed, the administration of glucocorticoids to a young animal may be very detrimental to its growth, leading to a stunting condition. The pharmacological effects that veterinarians and cl other clinicians try to take advantage of are often anti-inflammatory. Um, and so what, let's talk about what those effects are. Well, we, I've already talked about the fact that microcirculation and cell membrane integrity can be sustained. Um, and in addition, by doing so, we're preventing the release of many of these bags of enzymes, lysozymes, into a surrounding tissue and therefore reduces the disruption of connective tissue and cells. That also contributes. So this progressive digestion is interfered with. Continuing with anti-inflammatory effects, we just described that they stabilize lysosomal enzymes. They also tend to uh, reduce the formation of induced histamine, which is very locally produced histamine that's very difficult to block with antihistamines. Uh, and they also may reduce or antagonize toxins and kinins, um, which contribute to inflammation. So to summarize the actions of glucocorticoids, there are many beneficial effects, but most of these effects are nonspecific. That means they have effects regardless of whether the insult is inflammatory or toxic or whatever. Um, and so we have to be very... Uh, circumspect when we use them and realize that we can show good early benefit uh, with giving glucocorticoids, but many of those sort of side effects, which we're going to talk about in later units, manifest themselves later on. S suppression of the immune system, antagonism of insulin, etc.